and yeah. nothing established. As is tradition, I'm going to open up the first round of questions to the panelists to see if you have any questions you wish to ask the speakers from this morning. Well, I might ask a question of Steve. I seem already to be on. Um, okay. So it was a wonderful talk. And um, one of the things I wondered about arises in the context of the Wall Street Journal, who has a tendency to go on about Solyndra and how Solyndra is sort of um, the prototype of why government should have nothing to do with renewable energy. And I have the feeling it's probably a terribly large topic um, that may not be answerable in, in a, a, a short compass. But I wonder if you might be able to say a little bit about Solyndra. Sure. Let me first put in context yeah. of, of the larger loan program, which had several buckets, advanced automobile manufacturing for more efficient vehicles, uh, investment in new technologies, investment in technologies that could be deployed, uh, and then there's actually investments in uh, demonstrations for clean coal and nuclear. Um, the loan program in all of those investments of the part that uses taxpayer money, which is the m most important part, uh, made loans of where it has a guarantee or backing of maybe $10 billion. Uh, the majority of those loans, about between 90 to 95 percent, will be paid back in full. Uh, that is uh, something the public, the Wall Street Journal doesn't stress. Uh, they, that was actually in the time we were making the loans, 2009 through 2012, 13, is not, it's not venture capital better returns, it's much better than Wall Street. And uh, to get paid back 90 to 95%. Uh, what the American public doesn't also realize is that when you give a loan, there has to be a sort of insurance of that loan, and there's a set aside, and that how much was set aside is determined not by the Department of Energy, but by the OMB, which determines the economic risk. And the amount of money set aside is this billions of dollars. Uh, it was about five, ten billion dollars of set aside. That means you can't spend it on defense, you can't spend it on bridges, you can't spend it on anything. It's now set aside. Uh, so Solyndra was a big loss. It was the first loss. It was picked by career employees in the previous administration. That's also not stressed. Um, it was, it, the amount we're going to lose in total will probably be about one to one and a half billion. And so the public doesn't know, but why would you appropriate 10 to set aside if you won't tolerate a half a billion? And so Ford Motor Company, uh, $6 billion loan, the OMB decided it needed to set aside 50%. The probability of that loan not being paid back was 50%. The OMB decided for Solyndra, 12%. So at the time the loan was made, the OMB decided Ford Motor Company was a much bigger risk than Solyndra, also not widely known. Uh, that $3 billion of set aside for just the Ford loan, which will be paid back in full, will cover more than double any loans we anticipate losing. And so, now, having said all of that, is it necessary to have a loan program? At that time, I think it, you know, I'm not an, I, I'm a big believer in research and development. Let me get this straight. <laughs> and the more it goes to the deployment, the more I think okay, it, we sh the government shouldn't be in this, it should be private investors. But having said that, what we found in particular about the majority of the loans which we made, which were on wind and solar, so it was, I, there was a causation part of the solar, you make a loan for a couple hundred million dollars, the project developer builds the solar farm, the wind farm, but before they build it, they have a contract that says, we will sell you the electricity from solar or wind, uh, we will guarantee a certain amount that we will have to deliver, and you guarantee us a price. Virtually all those loans will be paid back. 
because as soon as you build a project, you, you're selling electricity, uh, and uh, unless there's a catastrophic event, an earthquake swallows up the wind farm and solar, you know, you're going to be okay. And, and so all those loans uh, would be paid back. The question is, why did we need taxpayer money? And the answer is, Wall Street was not making long-term loans. And in fact, they continued not to want to make long-term loans. What they like to do is they want to make short-term loans, securitize, bundle, and sell it off, and just turn, flip it in a couple of years. But for a solar wind, uh, a wind farm or a solar farm, it's a 20-year payback. And the financial community didn't want to make 20-year, you know, like a real house mortgage, 20 or 30 years, you know, like, right? Uh, and the financial community was not in that. They're still mostly not in that. And so you could not get these things going. Now that we've proved you can get a couple hundred million dollar solar wind farms, it's become bankable. Warren Buffett has invested in one of the solar farms we started. He's now bought a, a considerable part of that, of solar. So, so in that sense, I look back and said, yes, in the period where we were making those loans, it did serve a useful purpose. Uh, the riskiest ones were the new manufacturing people, but but so uh, it's um, that's that was that's just pure politics, in all candor. It it it, it had a useful purpose. Uh, I don't think we need it anymore. It's a proven technology, so I think it should be private sector now. I have one for yes, sir. Okay. I have one for Steve too, uh, if I may. I'm Harry Gray. I'm going to talk about solar fuels tomorrow. And I'm very interested. Of course, you gave a terrific talk, Steve, and set me up very nicely. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'll show what maybe what can possibly work tomorrow. But what I'd like to have a, now is a prediction from you. Of You pointed out the very small percentage we have now in solar of the total energy. Uh, inventory, where do you think we'll be in 2030 with solar in terms of percentage of the national energy inventory? Uh, Give me a prediction because I'm hoping to live that long uh, and check you out. Well, first I have a caveat, uh, and I have to remind uh, the people here what what very wise thing the greatest American philosopher of the 20th century said. By the way, that's Yogi Berra. <laughs> and, yeah, right. and he said, predictions are hard to make, especially about the future. <laughs> he also said, when you get to a fork in the road, take, take it. it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, we're lost, but we're making good time. <laughs> anyway, never mind. <laughs> You're digress. stalling, man. You're uh, thinking on your feet. No, 30... By 2030, I would say uh, certainly 5% uh, because already in the sun states, Southern California, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, bits of Colorado, all, um, the price has gotten, is dropping so fast that for commercial and for residential and for utility scale, it is becoming uh, reasonably competitive, and especially because it it, um, it replaces electricity where you need it the most in those hot summer days when there's an air conditioning load. That's at least five percent. If it's, I don't know if it's going to go. Spain is now four percent. Uh, so this is a modest uh, prediction. Prediction. Uh, it could be higher. Could it be 30, 40 percent? I doubt it. I think the combination of wind and solar in the United States could be 30% by 2030, maybe more. I think it'll I, be 50%. I hope it will be 50% by 2030. I predict that right now. Yeah, Spain, Spain, <laughs> Spain, good. So he's going on a limb because he's not a politician. <laughs> but, but seriously, uh, Spain, I just remind you, Spain is already 25%. <laughs> And, and uh, the United States, and it will be a low-cost solution at 25% for sure, or 30%. A, a word of warning about the Wall Street Journal. It's been taken over by Rupert Murdoch. So the same attitudes which uh, you see on Fox TV and Fox News are gradually coming into the Wall Street Journal. 
so I think it's, you need to be careful. It is a stroke of genius. It's now free in almost every hotel all over the world. And I don't need to remind you the, the Murdoch's involvement with uh, the phone hacking uh, issues in the UK and his newspapers. So those who read it, uh, a word of warning, because uh, certainly he, the people who are writing the editorials mm -hmm. are very different from those writing the editorials of other newspapers. I'm glad to hear that because I don't read the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> <laughs> Well, a lot of people do. Yeah. It's, a, it, it's, it's important to know what everybody thinks. I read the New York Times. Well, I, I'm just saying it's a good idea to have balance. And, and, of course, your point is well taken that Rupert Murdoch owns the Wall Street Journal. But part of what motivated my question was that I really wanted to do give Steve a chance to address sure. some of those questions. So I, in, in a certain sense, it was a pitch. It's only a word plate. of warning. But, but um, uh, we, my wife and I both read the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. Yeah. <laughs> and um, amazingly, she forces herself to read most of the articles on the op-ed and editorial pages. Uh, I can only force myself to read about half of them. <laughs> but but it, it, is, it is worth reading. You have to know. You have to know. The widespread, you know, economists also. Um. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll take a couple questions from the, the audience, and this one is for Sir Croto. How can public schools encourage this kind of messing about in science and still <laughs> adhere to standards? Say it again. How can public schools encourage this messing about with science and still have standards? And still have standards. Well, I mean, any science would be good and in the sense that uh, um, I think it will depend on the teachers where, who are teaching it. And uh, I think one problem, as I see, if I look on YouTube, I'm seeing teachers who uh, are teaching science uh, and at the very basic level uh, have real problems presenting what science is. And I think, uh, for me, science is not just uh, knowledge. Uh, which you learn at school. It's not just uh, the application of that knowledge technology. And it's not even just the uh, methods of, uh, by whereby new knowledge is discovered. It's a way of thinking. And uh, I think that, that sort of philosophical way of thinking aspect has been lost because science is so useful. It's, uh, over, been, it's overshadowed. And so governments think that the only science that you, is worth doing is that which you can prove to be useful before you've actually done it, which is just ridiculous. But the way of thinking, I think, is the most important, and it's about truth and about asking for evidence and questioning. And no one, has, for me, has, uh, has described science better than uh, Walt Whitman. He says, I like the, the scientific spirit, the holding off, the being sure, but not too sure. Uh, the willingness to accept the evidence when it is against you that is very fine because it keeps the way beyond open. And so the fundamental aspect of science is not just all this, let's learn this and what, you know, penicillin and all these other things. It's a way of thinking. And I think it's a big problem in this country. For me, I don't think very many people are actually thinking uh, about evidence. They're accepting things. They're listening to people who say things about global warming. They listen to you, Steve. And they listen to astronauts who said there's no such thing as global warming, okay? So these have the ear of governors. So I think, uh, for me, uh, the first step is something that has been forgotten, and that is to teach our young people how they can actually decide what they're being told is actually true. And that based on evidence, and that is, makes a big, has a big problem at the fundamental level in our schools, it seems to me. So I... I I start from there, and I see this country as having a major problem with young people who are thinking. Um, and, but that's where it starts. And until you get that right, there's no point doing anything else as far as I'm concerned. Have, have you ever played Minecraft? Pardon? Have you ever played the game Minecraft? Yes, I think so. What do you think of it? Well, no, I, sorry, I don't know that game. No, sorry. I, I understand what you're saying. It's, the, it, actually, the sound is much poorer here than it is down there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very difficult for me to hear. No, I don't know that uh, game. Okay. Okay. I don't play games. 
<laughs> the, the universe is hard enough. It's like Muhammad Ali, you know. It punches you on the nose Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and tells you you're stupid. And that's what science does. It, no other, no other uh, sort of uh, subject does that because so, the way the universe is. And I think uh, we have to teach our young people evidence-based things. It's very so, fundamental. So and it will be, once you do that, you've, you've won the game. Sure. So, so how do we encourage play? So Minecraft is a, is a creative game for those who have not played it where you have to build things and discover things. I think you can see that little girl, hands-on. Right. I mean, she was making things with her hands, and the big problem today is that, you know, if I go all across the campus of FSU, about 70% of the kids have got either got a mobile phone in their hand or the, half of them are on it, okay? What were they doing before? Maybe they were doing something more useful, and I think the technologies we have today are almost impossible to get into. So the kid is two or three years old, or he has an iPad, but they don't know how it works. Whereas when I was a kid, every, I could fix the radio. I could learn how it worked. We learn things by fixing things. So I think we, our schools need to have things that they can fix. But the problem, of course, is in the last 20 or 30 years, we've got these uh, quantum devices. We've got uh, things which are almost impossible to know what's going on. And so there's a big problem right at the start in getting young people to know what's going on. I could take the, the radio apart. I could put the valves in. I could see how the valve works. And that's a big problem today, a massive one, I see. So I, you know, I agree with you, everything you said, Harry. Um, I hope so. <laughs> uh, let, me, let me tell you a story I learned maybe 12 years ago from a, a colleague of mine uh, who's a professor of physics at Harvard. Uh, and it goes to this, you know, with your hands. Uh, and it was a lab, an undergraduate physics lab at Harvard. And they, instead of having a canned experiment, they gave me a little baggie with a light bulb, a little battery, some bits of wire, some other things, some irrelevant stuff. And their task for the next three hours was make the light bulb light. And he said about a third to half of the students could not know how to do that. A battery, a wire, a light bulb, a couple of wires, little bits and pieces. Harvard, Whew. undergraduate <laughs> physics. They could have done it at Caltech. They could have done it at Stanford. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the point is that, the, you, know, you know, I grew up with erector sets. You grew up with the, that other, uh, other brand. The original one. <laughs> and, uh, and people who live on farms, they know how to work with their hands. People, and this is being lost now in the younger generation, and, but we can put it back in schools, and we have to put it back in schools, K through 12 and college. So my, my son's sixth grade physics class, which apparently is equivalent to Harvard, they <laughs> have done very similar work, and a shout out to Dr. Gertie Ward in Durham, North Carolina for her good work here, but in trying to understand um, the basics of electromagnetism, she has the kids there building circuits, and through their hands-on work, they really discover what's the difference between a parallel and a series circuit. How does that impact the function? What are the real relationships between voltage and current? And they discover these principles, but then they know them far better than if they just read them out of the textbook. And I think when it comes back to the question about how does it apply to standards, I think these kids will be able to do much better on tests because they fundamentally understand those relationships. Well, thank you to all of you for this question and answer. And we need to wrap up or else we're going to miss lunch. So thank you. Thanks.